Thanks for tuning in to Power Athlete Radio. Derek Hansen has an extensive background in making athletes faster. A pupil of the infamous sprinting coach Charlie Francis, Hansen has followed suit by working with some of the highest performers in the world of sport. While Derek's knowledge of speed science is unparalleled, he refuses to hold tight to traditional ways of training. He believes that it's a coaching obligation to always be incorporating new information and potentially cutting edge research findings into your programming. Derek strikes an intelligent balance in training. His style reflects a responsible and simple approach while still allowing flexibility for an individual's inherent potential. As Derek explains, trial and error is the most valuable feedback within the practice of coaching. Tune in for numerous anecdotes that touch on the volume versus intensity debate. As we know, more isn't necessarily better. It's just more. This is episode 212. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children children of all ages, children of all ages. This is Luke with Power Athlete. We have Tex. Say hi, Tex. Howdy. And we have Mr. Whisper, silent but deadly, (laughs) John Wellborn. If the pre-show is any indicator of what the hell you're going to get, it's going to be an earful of John. Do you not feel like talking today Uh, again, John? No, I didn't feel like talking on the drive Uh, over. Here we go. But I was also up at 5 a.m. and I think I'm on like my seventh double shot of espresso. There we go. Uh, As you guys know, uh, my little boy's teething and so he's uh, sleeping in about three hour intervals. I don't think they know, but we definitely (sighs) know. I've seen that kid drooling. Oh, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> dude. Like I keep changing his shirt. He's, he's drooling everywhere. But um, I was up at five and I've been drinking coffee ever since in anticipation of this podcast. So there you go, listeners. John Wellborn will not be, will not be talking I'm on sleep. this very I'm, special I'm, I'm episode of the premier podcast in strength and conditioning. 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 Yeah. Uh, let's just get jump right into it. We had great pre-show chat. Well, we got Derek Hansen on the line. I'm going to give like four bullet points, Derek, and then you're going to hand it off and tell everybody what the hell that means, right? Uh, so your founder and primary contributor, strengthpowerspeed.com. I have a feeling people, if you want to learn a little more after your mind is blown after this, that's a good place to start. But man, you've worked with Olympic athletes, national athletes up in Canada. You're involved with the NCAA. Text cross paths with you at the Play Summit. And uh, I think what what was music to our ears is you have very similar mentors and in, in kind of guiding thought process to in empowering individuals with speed that we do. So it's like, uh, you know, two peas in a pod. And we're excited to get here and just chit chat about a lot of the jiggy stuff that you uh, you delivered at the play summit and beyond. Yeah. And that that opportunity to kind of have that conversation with uh, your great list of mentors and now our opportunity to kind of instead of just reading their material have that conversation with you and really learn from your experiences the source of the knowledge so Derek let these people know what's up if they've never heard of you <laughs> well you guys uh, Joe Rogan has nothing on you guys um he's a yeah. hack <laughs> which one's that is that the is that the cooking one? No, oh, I thought that was the space one. Oh, the space yeah yeah Joe DeGrasse Tyson yeah <laughs> <laughs> Derek go ahead man yeah thanks for having me on guys uh I I've obviously done some research on what you guys are doing and and I'm pretty happy to be involved in uh, discussing the details of how we approach things. So I think for me, um, again, I I was very fortunate to have some people guide me. And uh, I think the important thing for some of the listeners too, is you got to go out and you got to find stuff. You can't just have it served up to you or hope it just, you know, drops in your lap. Um, And obviously the internet, is a great place to start, but that's just a starting point. You have to go visit and hang with people and watch what they do because you'll find out very quickly that people will say one thing, but whether or not they do it is entirely different. Um, And and, and that's pretty important, uh, particularly in this day and age. So uh, a lot of the stuff that I learned was kind of pre-internet and you'd go and you'd visit people and you'd talk to them and you would, you would look at them in their eye and stuff like that. And so, um, that has been a big part of my development and all I'm trying to do is just pass on that stuff that I learned, the simple stuff, you know, as Al Vermeil always says, like, uh, simple, uh, application, complex explanation. And I had a chance to present with those guys a couple of weeks ago, Al Vermeil, Don Chu, Al Miller, Johnny Parker, Rob Panarello. And I was just kind of sitting back going, Hey, yeah, I'm glad you invited me. Um, but everything was pretty simple. We, you know, a couple of presenters didn't even have PowerPoint slides, which I think blew people away. Like, well, what do you mean you don't have a presentation? Because we're so dialed into technology and everything right now. So um, it's it's just refreshing to 
to fall back on those types of people uh, who spent whatever 25, 30 years working in the trenches and, and, and just pulling out stories uh, that, that, that support everything we're talking about here today. So uh, for me, um, you know, I had a track and field background as an athlete, collegiate athlete, national athlete, and then I just gravitated into coaching almost accidentally during uh, my grad degree, you know, started coaching and never, I, it was never a, an outcome that I was looking for, but I don't know. You just, you know, once you, as you guys know, once you start coaching, it's just kind of organic and it just kind of builds on itself. Um, and so from track and field started working with other athletes and, and, and everything does fall back to this, this idea that I should be able to measure my improvement. And, and if I work with an athlete on strength, power, speed, whatever, um, I should see a measurable improvement on the other end that could be applicable in a, in an individual sport setting or a team sport setting. And I think a lot of the time that gets lost, like, are we actually improving? Like, Hey, we're having a good time here. And you know, you're pretty cool and he, and he's pretty cool. And Hey, you know, we got a great little posse here, but are people improving? And I think people miss that. Um, and maybe some, to some degree, people are afraid of it. And I, and it's interesting with our, 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 uh, sort of pre-talk uh, discussion about electrical muscle stimulation and John talking about how he found it was useful. And, and I'm saying, yeah, like I found it was useful too. And, and it's still very difficult to convince people to, to look at that technology, which has been around for decades. So it's not, it, yeah, it's not yeah. new. I mean, there were guys in the 1700s, like, you know, stimulating frogs and stuff. So um, if you go back and you look at, you know, how much work has been done, it's apparent that it works. Now, how come we aren't using it more? Uh, you know, but you know, and then how come we're not sprinting more? All these obvious things. <laughs> these are all. <laughs> as I'm sitting here laughing, thinking about your you know comment about the internet, we've said the exact same thing for years. That uh, you know, I mean, I, I can think of numerous people that I've talked to that have told me, "Hey, this is what we're doing." And then you show up, and that's not at all what they were doing. And unfortunately, on you know page 37 of some forums with the guy with 7,000 posts. Uh, you know, when you're secret squirreling at 11 o'clock at night looking for the secret of life, um, it's rarely there. And it's, you know, you have to go out and, like you said, visit people. Um, yeah, the EMS stuff is, uh, to me, it it almost feels sometimes like I'm taking crazy pills. Because uh, if you use, if you're in your training cycle and you use the device and everything else is progressing at a normal rate, then all of a sudden you see something that dramatically changes. I mean, that's what we've seen for years with the EMS. I mean, and obviously the more... Uh, you know, knew somebody is to it, the greater the effect. And I think where things got really jiggy and we started trying to figure out is how to work it with people that are more veterans and have more exposure to it. And I think that's really the, uh, the big case. I mean, and, um, you know, and then also trying to figure out, uh, you know, what's the low hanging fruit, what's the biggest uh, reward for the least amount of work. And I think about, especially with training, I'm sure you run into this because people approach you with a million different modalities and whatnot, this thing, you know, the, the ARP wave, the Omega wave, what works. And I think about like, what's the least amount of work I can get for the maximum return? Like this might be the best thing ever, but it costs $20,000 and it might only help me 1%. And what I really gratitude with EMS was uh, it took me from not being able to do a body weight squat to all of a sudden squatting 315 in about three weeks. And then all of a sudden going back and starting 16 games after I injured my knee, my, my second or my rookie year. So in the NFL, so I'm a huge believer and I'm just always excited to, to connect with people that understand it better than I do. Yeah. And, and I, uh, anytime somebody gets an EMS device, they ask me like, Oh, can you show me how to use it? Can, do you have a manual that tells me how to use it? And I'm like, guess what? The best way to learn is trial and error for the most part. And, and that, that really applies to EMS because everybody's going to have somewhat different individual responses. And if you put it on yourself and you go down that rabbit hole, it gets very interesting very quickly. Um, so I don't, like Charlie, I don't necessarily like mapping everything out for people because there has to be some self-discovery. Um, and that's how you retain and you learn, which is interesting. I was talking to somebody about online learning that universities are all doing online learning now. And, and there's no trial and error, like read this, you know, answer this question. Um, there's no interaction. There's no, you know, um, uh, iteration. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think the problem is, is that we're in an unconventional age where we've never had an opportunity to connect with people this fast. And, uh, you know, which is 
interesting because it's allowed people to do more. Like I always thought with the uh, advent of the, you know, the cell phone, the internet, email, all these other things that it would effectively allow people more time to do things. And what have we found? Nobody has any time for anything. I constantly, I have, I don't have time for that. And I think to myself, we have cars, we have airplanes, we have uh, email, we have phones, we have texts, we have all these different, uh, you know, mediums to contact people. And yet we still have no time to do anything which uh, absolutely blows my mind because then I ask people like, what do you have time for? Obviously you don't have time to work out. You don't have time to meal prep. You don't have time to, to, to read. You don't have time to do anything. What do well, you have time to do? Commenting on Instagram. Takes a lot <laughs> of time. I mean, but the, uh, you made an interesting point with the EMS. Um, it, yeah. I mean, everybody reacts different. I mean, uh, a big thing that, and I was kind of thinking about, uh, you know, let's say like a genetic pool for somebody. And I remember when they first approached me, uh, you know, from, you know, how to use the EMS, especially with, uh, you know, PowerDot and also Compex, uh, everybody immediately wanted to try to work those type 2X fibers. And we're like, hey, I want to ramp it up to the highest intensity. I want to hit the highest frequency. I want to try to recruit these. And my comment to them is how much of that do you have? You know, like how much, like, like we, we can only stimulate what's bioavailable to us. And, uh, you know, if you were talking about somebody that's a, you know, sub 11 second, hundred meter runner, is he going to have more fast twitch, uh, or a, a running back out of the NFL, a post from somebody just standing on the corner who's got a, you know, maybe a 16 inch vertical jump. And so, uh, that was pretty interesting when I started kind of using it on a huge cross section, I found that the people that were more explosive, that were stronger, that maybe had a double body weight back squat or, you know, 30 plus inch vertical were able to get more out of the high end work than the people that couldn't, which is just kind of common sense. Yeah. And, uh, unfortunately what the EMS was really good about is if you know who you are as an athlete and you know where your strengths and your weaknesses are, there's a way to kind of figure out where, you know, what the programming looks like. And the problem is, is most of the stuff, and you know this from working with sprinters, uh, you know, everybody wants to know, like, you know, let's Charlie, uh, Charlie Francis, for example, um, what did Ben Johnson do? And it's like, you could do Ben Johnson's program, you could do Usain Bolt's program, and you're never going to run as fast as those guys. So why would you think that their program, and that's what always kind of blows me away with uh, strength coaches, you know, we go to these different things, and everybody gets up and presents, this is the program I did with this professional athlete or this team. And uh, I just kind of always laugh and I'm like, dude, I played in the NFL and I played with guys that never lifted weights and could still go in and bench five and 600 pounds. I, I played with guys that didn't run for six months and still went out and ran four fours, four threes. So it, when you take the, uh, a, a game that's, and especially at like the Olympics too, that's predicated on genetic freaks, you can't necessarily design training programs or apply training programs or modalities or protocols from these very unique populations to, you know, from you know, this side of the bell curve down to this part. But that's what everybody wants to know and that's what everybody wants to uh, necessarily do. Yeah, and, and I'm writing this article right now. Uh, I'll, I'll probably write it, it'll write it for the next six months, but it's basically, you know, don't take credit for natural selection and the NFL is, should be the NSL, right? The Natural Selection League. Huh. Um, because everybody's taking credit for, you know, this talent that's just risen to the top automatically because of, of just that's how it works uh, unfortunately um and yes you can manipulate things a little bit and, and you know help people on the rehab side and the recovery side but for, like you said for the most part we walk into an nfl training facility um nobody's doing like fabulous looking snatches or cleans or you know anything amazing in the weight room if it is the guy's a practice player or you know he doesn't play that much and so that's where he's spending his energy um so once you've seen that, then it kind of puts things into perspective and you get a better idea of what you can control um, uh, or where you try to get value, I guess, or, you know, the big, biggest bang for your buck. And it's not going to be teaching somebody complex weightlifting exercises. Um, so I think uh, that that's... Oh, sorry. That, uh, oh. That's the uh, training program I came out of. I, you know, uh, started powerlifting in high school with a guy named George Zangus and then uh, went on to Berkeley. And then I had a strength coach named Todd Rice, who was a big um, Olympic lifting guy and also a big speed guy. And then so I learned all that stuff. So when I went to go play for uh, the Eagles, we went to a high intensity training program, which was basically all machine based. And, uh, and then they finally, you know, went into a kind of a little more mixed deal. But I remember walking in and, and all of the equipment that I'd been used to in a straight up, you know, front squat, snatch, clean and jerk Olympic lifting program with no machines. And then I walk into the Eagles, which is nothing but machines, uh, you know, high intensity, one set to failure type stuff. And uh, I got stronger. 
And I remember, uh, uh, <laughs> and people ask me, well, how did that happen? I'm like, I don't know. But every time I've walked into the weight room when I wasn't injured, I actually got stronger. And it happened like that for years. I mean, I squatted 600 before I was 20. I benched 500 before I was 22. And uh, I was like, I was always physically strong. And I had the ability to use that strength on the field, which was also confusing because I played with guys that were as strong as me that couldn't, you know, break a, you know, couldn't break a chopstick on the field. So it was, uh, there, there was just a lot of interesting questions that I would see where I'd watch guys that were real strong in the weight room that couldn't play. I watched guys that weren't strong in the weight room that would just kill people on the field. And then I watched for a certain blend of people that were strong in the weight room and had the ability to use it on the field. And uh, a, a lot of what you see with, within a power athlete was me asking these questions and trying to figure out why certain people are able to do certain things and how it all kind of fit. And, uh, you know, and especially with the speed stuff, I mean, I, uh, I remember watching people run and the guys that were able to have the capacity to be able to run as fast as they could more often were faster than the guys that didn't have the capacity to run more often. And I remember somebody was talking to me about speed and I was like, I think the more fast you can run, the faster you are. And they were like, what? And I'm like, I'm just telling you, like the more opportunity you have to run fast, the faster you'll become. If you either uh, don't have the conditioning, don't have the opportunity. And I kind of went through it. I'm like, I mean, uh, it just, it became a lot of these just kind of things that when you, when you say them out loud or you see them, they become truce. And then when you explain it to people, people are like, I just don't get that. And I'm like, how, how are you not seeing this? So that was some of the observation and kind of how we started this whole deal. Yeah. And, and like you said, you have all of these abilities and you have to now cater your training to what their, whatever their, uh, their ability is, what their deficiencies are. And, and, and that's, but, but you can't take training and say, well, this is going to make you be everybody better. And it's just like EMS EMS, as you found out is you have to tailor it to specific qualities, whether it's fiber type or, you know, what kind of training you're doing. Uh, but you're making all of the alterations on your end. You're not expecting the athlete to just adapt to whatever you throw at him or her. Right. So, and I, that's, that's the great thing about EMS is that it, forces you to learn, right? It's a teaching device. And that's the most important aspect that I try to convey in my presentations is it gives you feedback because you're, you're controlling the amount of current going into somebody and there's limitations, right? I can, you know, either I need to add more or I need to add less depending on what their profiles are. Um, and that, that teaches me more about how I should train them. And the example I've been using in all my presentations is the Olympic weightlifter. She's now the gold medalist in 2012. Um, I think a 63 kilo class. I, you know, I'm not a big weightlift, Olympic weightlifting uh, got, got guru by any means, but she got injured. And uh, of course, the physical therapists at the time were getting her to do like, you know, high repetition clamshells and all the, you know, hurt her knee. Oh, it must be your hip. You're not strong enough in your hip, even though you're like world champion. Um, and all sorts of nonsense like that. And so they're getting her to do general population exercises to cure a problem in a Ferrari, right? So, you know, a Honda Civic mechanic should not be working on a Ferrari, you know, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying all this stuff, but, I mean, uh, and then you know, we say more <laughs> stuff than that. Believe me. Uh, at the end of the day, here's the one thing that's so unique about our podcast. We've already offended everybody so, so much that I really doubt that you can offend anybody. And if they do and they are offended, then Get you know what? Here. Then they can go fuck themselves. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you so, can't have a mechanic working on a Ferrari. Yeah. So, uh, so you have a year where she has chronic acute pain, chronic pain in her knee. MRI shows nothing. They go in, they scope it, they find nothing, but they bugger it up some more. And a year later, somebody talks to me and says, well, what do you think? And I'm like, well, how are you guys dealing with this? Well, we're doing high reps and we're treating her like, you know, a regular physical therapy patient. I'm like, well, there's your problem. Like, why don't you start lifting her heavy again, using EMS to kind of facilitate the process. And then guess what? Three weeks later, she starts improving. So you go through a year of nonsense and somebody who looks at her as, uh, looks at her, you know, what she presents and she presents fast twitch, you know, high end, um, high end athlete. And so we have to treat her, treat her as such. And, and, and the, the, the EMS confirmed that when you use it, uh, you don't need a lot of juice to fire up her muscles because she's very fast twitch oriented. Uh, but on the injured side, she had some issues. We had to use more. I'm like, oh, okay, so there's something 
you know, there's a noxious stimulus in the knee pain that's preventing her from firing her VMO. So we have to use EMS to bypass that. And guess what? It worked really well. Um, but were you uh, using this in a, a pre or post workout uh, situation with her? Ah, uh, we were using it all the time. Like we were using it before, you know, to help her uh, warm up a combination of active recovery, pulsing, and shorter duration, shorter, lower volume, high intensity, like 70 to 100 hertz contractions with long breaks, but almost kind of, for lack of a better word, to potentiate, activate. I hate those words. But um, yeah, p- potentiation just always seems like a waste of time to me. Yeah, I'm yeah. Not, anytime I see the potentiation protocols, I just throw those out. I'm like, uh, I don't need to potentiate. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, high something high intensity to kind of, get her nervous system activated and it works really well. Then we do voluntary training, sometimes superimposed. Um, and then we do some, some work after to try to hit any fiber that may not have been uh, worked in the man in the voluntary session. So, and then when she went home on her off days, uh, we'd still have some high intensity work with the EMS. Uh, and then what I found out in a roundabout way is that in any heavy lifting, no pain, but when she would walk around the house or walk her dog, she had pain. So then I started throwing in low intensity or sorry, low frequency, uh, like 40, 30 to 40 Hertz. And then that solved her, uh, her slow twitch fiber, uh, deficiencies and then pain went away. So that's, but that's purely trial and error. Um, I mean, I had some sense of, of how to use it, but, um, it was like, how are you feeling today? Okay. What protocols do we use? What do we get the intensity up to? Great. You know, and then you just make adjustments, right? But there's no grand plan. So wait, before, is it possible that there's someone listening that doesn't know what the fuck EMS is, that oh, maybe it's worth just yeah. giving them the two minute? Yeah, the uh, EMS is uh, electric muscle stimulation. And what they are is they're a series of pads that are hooked up to a unit. And the units have protocols that necessarily are designed to uh, recruit motor units through using electricity. Uh, the idea that your central nervous system fires and it you know, gets some fibers to type and motor units get to fire. But sometimes uh, there's neurological inhibition and you know, a million different factors to why it might not fire. So what effectively the unit is doing, it is uh, jump-starting, short-circuiting, cutting the CNS out of it. And by placing the pads in anywhere the pad touch will recruit motor units. Now, what's interesting, if we were to take you in the weight room and we were to train you, could you tell me how many motor units you were recruiting in a certain workout? I definitely could. Okay. <laughs> well, then you could. Uh, most people have no idea. Um, and But what we know with EMS is that you can get 100% motor unit recruitment. Now, we've used it in really interesting ways. Like, for example, and I feel awful about this. We had a guy, Matt Vincent, who's a, um, like the world's uh, top Highland Games athlete. And he was a thrower in college. Uh, really, you know, very explosive, very fast twitch guy, but a laundry list of injuries that were, you know, multiple pages yeah. and, and went, um, went untreated, I guess. Yeah, okay. And he, he, he's big on the, I'll just ignore it and then uh, recruit around it. So he came in to do some training stuff with us. Um, and for guys that are injured and a little on the older side, I tend to use it to kind of prime the muscles. So we did some, uh, uh, just some isometric holds and some basic um, accentuated negatives like manual resistance to get his you know, quads and hamstrings and different things to fire. And then we threw the EMS units on and kind of looked at like, uh, I think we were right around maybe 75, 80, 90 hertz. And we were hitting those for, you know, 10 seconds, you know, 30 seconds off and hit a couple rounds. Uh, got underneath and we were going to do some barbell work and uh, he, you know, we hook up a tendo and we were interested to see some, you know, compensatory acceleration, how fast he was able to move the bar from point A to point B. And at about 3.15, he stood up so fast that he effectively ruptured his ACL oh. in, in a closed chain movement. Was he wearing a kilt? Uh, no, but... Uh, <laughs> That's probably the problem. All, all, of a sudden, all of a sudden, he went down and he stood up and he said he hadn't felt his quads fire like that since he was probably a teenager. And as he stood up, the bar shot up so much and so fast that his knee kind of twisted. And I think he tore meniscus and ruptured his ACL. Oh, geez. I've never seen anybody do that in a closed chain movement, like with their foot planted. And I believe there's probably <laughs> bigger problems. But what yeah. was interesting was we got him to do something that he probably hadn't done in a long, long time. So from that, uh, you know, we felt awful. And he since had <laughs> surgery and fixed himself up. And he still uses the units because he said he hasn't felt as good since when he was using them. But what I found was that uh, for older athletes or for guys that were training that maybe have more mileage on them, actually using the EMS in a pre-workout environment uh, really helps them to kind of 
get everything kind of in play and working and kind of remind them how to use some stuff. Because as you know, the world's best athletes aren't necessarily the world's best athletes because they have the most gifted genetics. It's because a lot of times they're able to recruit around the most amount of injuries. Um, there's a guy in Kaysville, Utah, a guy named Craig Bueller, uh, who does AMIT, Activated Muscle Integration Technique. And he works with all these professional athletes. And he's like, honestly, uh, it's a little bit of natural selection and luck. And just the fact that uh, everybody's injured. So what allows one athlete to compete at a high level if everybody's injured? They can kind of recruit and get different things. Like if the quad fires up or it turns off, you can use some different things. And uh, it was just kind of an interesting observation he made. And he said, you know, if um, you can get an athlete completely balanced where everything's firing, he goes, and they're pretty high level. He goes, you know, you don't know if they're going to get better or worse. You just hope that, you know, they're able to go out and do what they want to do. Yeah. Well, that that's, I mean, that, I mean, I don't know how we qualify uh, uh, an advanced athlete, but the ab- ability to compensate um, is definitely part of that. And there's a running back that I've been trying to help out who had some ACL issues in a, on, on second one now, different leg. And I, I figure what happened after the first one, because they went through the same rehab protocol, which was somewhat deficient, I'll, I'll say that. Um, but after the first one, he could compensate so well that he could still you know, be a very good running back. But now after the second one, he's finding out very quickly that you know, those abilities uh, are just not uh, good enough now to overcome two a bilateral ACL issue. So um, did he, uh, he tore his ACL in his other knee when he came yeah, out? Yeah. You know, yeah. I, ironically, I tore my ACL in 96 and then uh, in my right knee and I, the, I would say my rehab was deficient and I came back too fast and um, it was pretty shitty. I'll just tell you that and ended up rupturing my patellar tendon in my left knee in 99, yeah. three years later. So, yeah. And then they stitched that back up. And then that, that's when I got into the MS stuff and ended up coming back and, playing for the rest of my career, you know, another nine years. Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of these, these athletes are left to their own devices and they haven't been, you know, are, are, for, for whatever reason, they're not searching out these alternative methods of, of getting them back. And, and you'll see careers end pretty, pretty quickly because of that. Um, so it's, it's, it's just kind of interesting. And, 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 in the in you know, as you know, in the NFL, like, okay, you're not useful to us anymore. We'll get somebody else. So well, it, take, uh, it takes care of itself in some, some respect. Uh, and NFL is, uh, is like, um, I always laugh that if uh, Darwin had gone to the NFL, he probably would have written his book even faster, you know, and the, the idea that the NFL means not for long and it's natural selection. that's baddest. I mean, I was telling, uh, we were out at Sornex and I told somebody the story that uh, I watched a guy bench, I think it was 500 plus 525 for like a set of five on the bench walk out on the football field and they cut him before the practice was done. (laughs) And I remember the guy, like literally we were like coming to like, you know, kind of the midpoint and they literally cut the guy. And I remember after practice, I'm like, wait, where'd that strong dude go? Like, Oh, we cut him. He gone. And I remember being like on the practice field, they cut him. Yeah. He was awful. I'm like, that dude just benched, you know, 525 for, for like a set of five, probably an under, you know, seven seconds. Like he was killing it. And, but you know what, at the end of the day, like, that's why the weight room and what people do in terms of the performance, like doesn't, you know, doesn't always correlate. And, uh, you know, as much as the NFL wants it to with, you know, with the combine and the testing and this guy can do this and, you know, all the numbers at the end of the day, they have a very difficult time quantifying that X factor that it, I mean, can the guy play regardless of all this other bullshit? Yeah. And, and, and even in some of the consulting work I do, people aren't like they have GPS now, but nobody gives a damn about it or uses it properly. But um, with the exception of maybe a few people, uh, but then the coaches don't give a damn. The head coach doesn't care. Right. So, but the idea that what is happening on the field is the most important thing, the most important stimulus for adaptation kind of gets put to the side, even by the strength and conditioning coaches. And if you understand how important the specifics of playing the game are, and maybe not even practicing. Practice is a different animal altogether. Then, then, then it becomes a little more clear what you have to do as a strength and conditioning coach. And I think that's what people miss. They're like, "Yeah, I'm this guy. I'm a, I'm a high low guy. I'm a, a west side guy. I'm, who cares, right? Like, I don't really care what your philosophy is. Your philosophy should be to support what's happening on the field. Um, and and all of your all of your direction should be based on the feedback that you're getting visually. Maybe you're using GPS. Maybe you have some t- 
testing protocol or whatever. I, I don't care. But or maybe you bring them into the maybe all that the weight room is is your ability to monitor their fatigue levels. I don't know, but I don't think anybody's figured it out. Um, and if well, anything, I think it's going in the opposite direction. Well, think about this. I I, uh, I think they need to change the job description a little bit, especially for strength coaches. And I think what they have to start doing is educating themselves on movement. Um, the one thing, and you, you made an interesting point, you said, you know, you watch these guys go in the weight room and, you know, they might be phenomenal movers outside, but you know, the guy who's lifting the best and doing this, isn't necessarily going to be the best guy on the field. And I always think that like, you know, that observation is so universally true. But if you were to take the guy who is the best performer out there and understand how to challenge posture and position with different, you know, you know, full range of motion movements and bring him in and then, uh, uh, you know, create more attention to detail and figure out maybe what his limiting factors and how to increase his or, you know, narrow his margin of error. I think for those specific people, then all of a sudden you're able to go here, but you bring a guy in who, you know, looks great in the weight room, big, strong dude. And all of a sudden he goes out on the field and he can't play dead. Uh, you know, that was a weird one for me. And I remember thinking like, why? And a big thing was guys were stiff in the NFL. That is like the biggest insult. If that guy you're stiff or that guy's a stiff, that might as well be mean he's probably sitting on the bus going home. So, you know, working on, you know, guys, uh, you know, and they always want to get stretch guys and work on flexibility. And I'm like, dude, it's not passive range of motion. It's active range of motion. You know, can these guys, you know, hold these positions? Can they bend their knees? Are they not waist benders? Can they do this under load? How do you teach that? And then how do you teach them to maintain that position while they move in space? And how do you teach them, you know, uh, not only how to understand uh, distance and how far things are and, and it just uh, like the whole body awareness thing. And um, for me, uh, as a, a young kid, I was big into martial arts and fighting and uh, boxing, especially, and that ability to cut a guy off and how to judge distances was something I learned at a young age and uh, allowed me to play for, you know, and do my job for as long as I did in the NFL. And I remember people asking me like, oh, did you play football? I'm like, I thought it was stupid. I didn't understand a thing about football. I just knew how to judge distance based on fighting. And uh, that was more valuable to me with how to cut a guy off in the ring, especially as offensive lineman, you know, playing two thirds out uh, than any football drill you could ever teach me. And, um, you know, and then being able to understand, uh, you know, why is it that certain people win and lose on plays? That was another one I've talked to these guys about. I had an, I mean, I ruptured my patellar tendon, so I sat a whole year on IR after I came and started as a rookie. And I just watched film and figured out like, you know, why did this guy win? Why did this guy lose? And the guy that was able to, you know, do it well longer and be able to impose his will and not look shitty ended up winning. And if you were able to have a guy come against you and force him into a bad position, a lot of times he lost. So then it became this whole thing that if I can maintain my position and I can maintain what I know is the proper technique, let's say, you know, if I can bend my knees, punch and slide, use my hands, you know, head back, do all these things and dictate my will on him where he cannot force me into a bad position. 99 out of 90 uh, out of 100 times I win and I remember kind of taking that systematic approach I'm like all right if it's perfection then it's perfection and I think for strength coaches if they got away from so much of the numbers because I could care less I never had anybody ask me how what my 40 time was I never had anybody say before the game so what did you bench today uh, on Friday nobody yeah. ever asked me that but if I had a strength coach that understood like Hey, you know, when you were doing that bench, uh, you know, your elbows flared out too much. And I know if your elbows flared, when you punch, your thumbs are going to be rotated and you're going to get your elbow collapsed. Or when I was watching you squat, I was watching your knees cave. And so when you get in your set and you go to set back, if your knee shoots in, then you're going to be a step slower than the guy getting off the ball. And I always remember like asking these questions and I'm like, you know, the guy on the field is doing the same shit that he's doing in the weight room. Like his knees collapse. So he's slow off the ball. He, uh, he, he's weak in his hips, so he can't sit in this position, like all these things. I'm like, why not see what's happening out here and then fix these deficiencies in the weight room? Make the connection. And make the connection. Yeah. And um, for me, it was, you know, I, I didn't need anybody to teach me this. And I remember having these conversations, and I remember my strength coaches being like, dude, you're, you're getting too deep with this shit. And I'm like, yeah, but this is my fucking job. This is what I get paid fucking lots of money for. Shouldn't I go deep on this? Yeah. And, and, and I think for strength coaches, and what I always appreciate about the sprint guys um, is they understand, uh, you know, that you got, you can watch somebody run and you can know if they're running fast because they're running fluid and graceful and it's easy. And you, I'm sure the, the people that look like they're doing it the most effortless are always the fastest. And I'm sure, you know, the guy that's bound up and running really hard is usually running the slowest. And the thing that I was appreciative uh, about running, especially working with sprint guys is they know when it looks easy and they know when it looks effortless. And that was what they were always striving for. Relax, big arm swing. I want you to drive your knees, you know, get into a good position. I want you just to feel like you're floating out there. 
And I think in football, they don't necessarily do that. And uh, I always thought that if we could give the strength coaches a more, uh, a better understanding of grace and movement, then I think that would help them tremendously in terms of developing the players on the field. I agree. I, I think um, they're too far removed from what happens in the game or on the field in practice. So uh, you have people like James Smith saying, well, you know, we don't, we should abandon strength and conditioning and all the coaches should know how to condition their athletes properly or, or prepare them. And I'm like, well, okay, that's a little naive to think that's going to happen. But I think you can take a strength coach or whatever you want to call them, physical preparation coach, and you can get them more involved in what happens in practice and how practice is organized and how, you know, how long each period is, you know, because fatigue is, is the biggest issue with a lot of these injuries and the stiffness that you talk about too. So if you try to drive too much work into their systems, guess what? Their bodies aren't going to allow that to happen. So do you need a quality control person helping to dictate how practice is carried out? I think you do. Is that going to happen? I don't know. But that, that's where I see most of the problems. Like you said, if somebody has a movement deficiency on the field in practice, as a strength coach, you can go back and you can try to re, you know, recruit better and, and get your alignment down in the way. But if you put them back on the field and the problem still occurs, then somebody has to address that on the field now. Um, and it may be workload related, uh, as you know. I mean, uh, if you do two a days, uh, on consecutive days, you know, there's going to be problems. Um, and the people who can't compensate as well are going to be the guys that fall the first. So, uh, if we want to get away from natural selection and have more control over these things, we have to really look at what's happening on the field, I think, but you know, is that going to happen? No. So Derek, as, as a consultant, I mean, do you, do you work with teams on this integration, you know, either at collegiate level or professional level, or maybe even, I don't know it's, if you're in a high school or amateur level. It's very difficult because just the hierarchy of how things work is the strength coach is at the bottom unless he has a very good relationship with the person at the top. And even then, it's difficult to get somebody to change. And there was a program that I, you know, we talked about how practice is organized and they were making those changes, but, and they were doing well. And then they lost one game. And then everybody's like, oh, oh we're going to throw it out the window. Right. That's a, yeah, let's abandon. That's the reason why we lost. It wasn't because, you know, we had 10 turnovers or whatever. But so, because we, we'll, we'll, we get that question a lot is like, uh, you know, how do how, I'm a coach? How do I get influence with a, with a, a yeah, sport coach? And it's really, I mean, you, what our advice has been is you have to earn the trust. And it's kind of a relationship building process first before it gets tactical, right? But even then, it looks like, uh, you know, from your experiences, what we've experienced is that decision-making process is so fragile. You know, it's like a bull in a china shop. When something goes wrong, everything falls apart. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so the relationship is probably the most important thing. The education piece as part of that relationship is important. Exactly. Yeah. And you, you can't tell people what to do. You have to kind of suggest. And uh, the biggest thing for me is like, you got to make it seem like it's their idea. And right. once and that's you- That's art in itself, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so that's where this whole microdosing um, thing came about for me was um, I'm, I'm writing a, a chapter for Jay DeMeo on one of his books and it's going to be just on how I came about with this microdosing approach and it was out of necessity. It was out of the fact that I couldn't control uh, at the professional level or collegiate level, I couldn't control what was happening on the field so I had to compensate on my end and be more creative in how uh, I dispensed the work so that it could jive with the crazy workloads that were happening on the field. Now, uh, would that work in a track and field setting where I have control over everything? Possibly. I don't know. I haven't really gone there, but I know from a team sport point of view, you know, like we said, we're adapting to the circumstances that we are given. Um, and a Can lot of strength. A little deeper on the microdosing philosophy. Yeah. Like if you go into uh, the research on microdosing, so there's kind of two streams. One is, Silicon Valley people microdosing LSD and, and, and baseball players microdosing testosterone, which, you know, we don't want to really talk about too much. But on the pharmaceutical level, they've done microdosing like one one hundredth of the what they would call the effective dose. Um, and they would just to get through the testing process so that they didn't have to go through this arduous process of approval through animal testing. And they could actually start doing tests on humans that wouldn't put them in jeopardy or it wouldn't be toxic. So 
they would do very small doses and see what the physiological effect would be or the physical effect would be. And then, you know, up, up dose from there, which is very interesting because we don't do that in training, do we? We, we go, let's hammer the crap out of them and then we'll start backing off if that, right? So, it, so from that approach, when I started talking to like NFL teams, I said, how much time do you have for each quality that you want to work on? And it, it was like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, like say warm up. Um, how much can we get done in warm up and can we do any speed work? Well, we can get an extra five minutes. And a lot of people would throw up their hands and say, well, fuck it. I, we're not going to do it then. That's five minutes. When I would say, well, I don't know, get two runs in, right, with good recoveries. And when, when I started dropping in these little doses of high intensity work, which to most people would seem insignificant, they were quite significant as you accumulated the work over time. So, well, well, I mean, this is kind of interesting and this is what I was going to come back to is if you look at most of the training modalities and the training protocols that most of the NFL teams use, it's kind of based off of this, like, you know, uh, seven to 10, seven to 12 reps, you know, kind of standard bodybuilding. And then majority of the work was, you know, like, Hey, let's go out and run, you know, uh, 10 half or 10 half gassers on the minute where you're running probably 75 to 85%. And I never trained in the off season with the team because I knew that uh, a lot of submaximal efforts would produce submaximal uh, performance on the field. So the, a lot of the stuff that we would do in the off season was uh, more max effort type stuff. I mean, I'd rather go out and run 10 40s with full recovery and run, you know, 90, uh, 90% plus. And what I found is when I came back, I had more capacity to work at a higher uh, a level because the NFL, it's five to seven seconds, 45 seconds rest. Now, if I can work at, you know, near peak for that five to seven seconds with the rest, I did better and I didn't fatigue as bad. And I remember every year I'd come back there, oh, he didn't make one off-season workout. And I'd be like, no problem. Let's go out and do all the testing. And I'd always go win all the testing. I'd win the conditioning. And when all of a sudden we'd be in double days when guys were getting killed, I didn't feel as tired. And I always believed that uh, the volume is what beats people up and you can recover more from the intensity. And um, it just was... So as you were talking about this microdosing, I mean, here you're, you're forcing guys into more of a max effort type situation and they're getting better. And I think it's because the stimulus is all fucked up. Every time I looked at these programs, I'm like, dude, this, you, you give me, tr- like me personally and the guys that do well in this job uh, are more, you know, similar to what you see for an Olympic sprinter more so than a guy who's, you know, swinging a hammer for, for eight hours. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, I mean, so. I think now's a good time too to just remind any listeners that when we talk intensity in this context, it's performing at maximal ability, not something that's hard and emotional. Yeah, it's the uh, you know intensity is relative to whatever your one RM. I mean, if you can squat five hundred, intensity would be you know ninety ninety five percent. That would be right. high intensity. The problem is, is that with the CrossFit stuff, yeah, it's we've, emotional. We've yeah, we've rebranded or people have rebranded intensity as emotion. How hard did you go? And I always remember thinking like as hard as I could every play. I mean, yeah. what do you mean? Like effort like, is assumed. Yeah. Effort's a given like it. And that kind of was an interesting thing. I mean, if you could, uh, you know, when you go back and you do your sprint stuff and you do your max effort versus your recovery or your volume runs, I mean, you're not necessarily asking the guy, well, how hard did you run? what was the time? I need you to run this time within a certain amount, within a certain period, because that's what we need for your percentage. And that's, you know, how we look at intensity. Whereas, you know, how hard did you, oh, I ran my ass off. Well, then that was high intensity. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I've, I've gotten away from high intensity and I'm using this concept of signal and noise and, and, and noise is pretty much everything we do, but signal is, is this innate ability to produce something extraordinary, right? So a, a, a sprint, a jump, a throw. Um, whereas uh, conditioning is noise production that supports all of this. Um, and if you and you figure this out very quickly with EMS, if you try to fire up a muscle with EMS uh, consecutively with not without enough recovery, fatigue enters in the equation, and you can't get as profound a contraction because you're constantly fatiguing. And this is again, this goes back to what John says, the fatigue is creating the problem and everything downgrades to noise. So if I run like 10 forties with one minute breaks, guess what? That's a conditioning workout. It's not a speed workout. And, and, and just getting this concept across that if I do less with more recovery, my returns are going to be greater because the, the intensity of that signal has now gone up. Right. But that's, that's the battle we're facing right now. Um, with, you know, the, the, the general population, which includes coaches, head coaches, they're part of, they don't have the, 
the background to understand that everything is more is better, more reps, you know, longer practices, longer meetings. Well, the, but that's what they do. I remember when I was at the Eagles, uh, they would always talk about how many hours they worked. And I remember my offensive line coach was like, man, I was here. I slept in the office. We worked 20 hours yesterday. And I remember before I would leave, I was always checked to see what they were doing. And they were always just sitting in their office, like fried out. And I'm like, dude, you just sitting here with your eyes open, eating, you know, eating snacks to stay awake, uh, not doing anything meaningful is just you just trying to say you're here, you know, because you think that there's this idea, hey, I worked 20 hours, uh, I got more work done. I mean, I'd rather have less hours of more meaningful stuff, how yeah. you go home and get a good night's sleep and see your family so your, your uh, home life isn't a wreck, than to just sit here and pretend that you're working because the coach wants to see you here 20 hours. Yeah, don't mistake activity for achievement. Well, really, right? but, you know, and, and he, he made a, another great point talking about that idea to, uh, you know, to work at those higher levels because, I mean, we saw it, man. The, the people that run the fastest are the fastest. Yeah. And uh, it just, it's, it seems like such a basic, con and I'm sure you get in the same stuff where you're like, this seems so simple, but yet people completely intuitively don't know it. And they kind of like, no, that can't be the case. I mean, if the more forties I run, the more, the faster I should be. And you're like, no, the quality of the work that you do and the speed at which you run them is directly related to it. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's entirely counter counterintuitive for most people, but I think we've been conditioned that way through society. You know, you know, the more tweets I get out, you know, the more I tweet, uh, the less people start to listen. I would think after a while, you're like, you just drown, drown out everything, right? You drown out the signal. So it's the same with training. And um, signal and noise is something that you introduced at the, the Played Speed Summit. And I wanted to get into that because it has to, so much to do with coaching and trial and error in which you said earlier with EMS. So uh, just like you described, right? Um, so we want to enhance the signal and take away the noise. And you talked about some of your trial and error with this concept at the, the speed clinic. Could you kind of explain a little bit of, of how you shifted from eliminating all noise and going all signal to kind of finding a balance between both? Yeah. And, and I think, uh, I think it was like Nate Silver who talks about, we have to uh, get better prediction abilities by eliminating all the bad data and all the noise. And Okay. In that, in that uh, scenario, it makes more sense um, when you're looking at statistics or, you know, trying to predict whether or not, you know, Donald Trump's going to win the presidency. Um, but as far as sports and physiology is concerned, we all need a certain amount of neural noise in our system to be functioning at, a, at an optimal level. And so how do we divide up our work? And if you get into that high low concept where you're doing all this tempo work and low intensity work, um, and a lot of people will like classify it as recovery, like this is recovery work, or I would say, no, it's, it's very foundational and not foundational in terms of like, I'm going to build a base and I'm going to, you know, be really, um, you know, uh, kind of, uh, trying to get this GPP base of all this work. No, 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 no. It's different. It's foundational in terms of, um, you know, my engine is idling at a very high rate so that my readiness is better. And, I, I, and it's a very difficult concept to drive home to people because it's, again, it's counterintuitive. Um, so, you know, if I do, if I do nothing, it's usually worse, right? If, if somebody is uh, dealing with depression and they just go and sleep all day, that just drives the depression deeper where you need some level of activation upon which they can kind of develop, you know, self-sufficiency and start thinking for themselves again and, and, and having positive thoughts. I think it's the same with training where you have to identify a positive level of noise that allows you to reach um, maximum efficiency. And then from that foundation, now you have these opportunities to, you know, develop signal, whether it's, you know, sprinting, like I said, throwing plyometrics and even lifting and lifting is, is difficult because I think it, it straddles that line between signal and noise. Lifting is, and the reason why is I see you, I see less transfer with lifting to most other activities, right? So then for me, that means it's foundational. Um, whereas Olympic lifting, maybe it's more signal, but then because it's so different than the activities I described, sprinting, throwing, jumping, um, maybe it, now interferes with my signal production, right? And that's what I found with sprinters when they became very competent at Olympic lifting. I, I saw there were um, plateauing in their sprinting. 
So then I had to get away from it and do more uh, what I would call basic lifts, squatting, deadlifting, pressing, whatever. And I think people have found that out. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we make a joke because uh, uh, I remember uh, Charlie had a great quote about why he had his sprinter's bench press. And we, whenever people are like, oh, bench pressing is worthless. It's not functional. People don't use it. I always just throw up Charlie's quote about it. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head what it was, but it was basically like, you know, uh, like, yeah, but, uh, well, it, but you know, long story, well, general, like, uh, like there was talking about. So yeah. It's a, play. it's a general stimulus that doesn't tax somebody too much in the peripheral way that they need to perform. So a bench press was very good for him because, you know, they need the legs to be fresh, but I needed something to keep my readiness level up without creating, you know, a well, negative, uh, it's what you're talking about, like, uh, the develop, I mean, cause I always looked at everything that's done within the confines of the gym as GPP training, you know, and I always love where people are like, Oh, we're doing sports specific training in the weight room. And I'm like, <laughs> no, like, the, and, uh, I was like, dude, if it's done within the confines, like if I'm playing football, whatever's done within the confines of the gym is GPP work. Now, when I'm on the field and even if I'm out there doing skills and drills and working, you know, punch slide, that's still GPP work. It is. The way I'm developing SPP is in relationship to another person where I'm, I'm forcing myself to work at a higher level with more, you know, technically, or I guess you could say like, you know, technical accuracy, I think was the, the term I've used, uh, you know, where there's competition and it's more reminiscent of what I'm going to do when, you know, the game unis are on and things are live. And, uh, you know, that's been another big thing that we've worked to really dispel is like, just because, uh, you know, you're doing punch drills in the weight room or you have a football, that's not, you know, sport specific training. And, uh, you know, whenever I think about whether it be plyo lifting, I mean, all these other movements, uh, at the end of the day, this is all base level general physical preparedness to try to, you know, peak you up. And the problem is, is, and the irony of this is with the CrossFit stuff, especially, I mean, now you have the sport of GPP, which as people competing it it's just i'm like ah, it doesn't make any sense yeah, blurs so. the line even more when you're trying to work with athletes or coaches who don't have the vision they just they can't delineate right and we find that tex and i personally because we've traveled around to many gyms and tried to work with some i don't know call them athletes high level crossfit athletes right but the, it's just a non didn't you said this earlier, Rach, on non-traditional world. Like it's a non-traditional sport well, with non-traditional training practices and to delineate things like uh, GPP versus readiness or, you know, in your terminology, Derek, uh, the, the signal and noise, it, uh, they, they can't, even some of the best can't delineate that. So that's how careers in this sport, I think, why they're short. Uh, they, you know, quick ripe, quick rotten type deal. Uh, because I think they're just, but also a sporting experience. We're coming from f field sport backgrounds in which mm -hmm. we've been outrun overpowered. So we've been, we've given our maximal effort and still got our ass kicked. Yeah. They, they have it. But because that is the, that's the nature of sport. Right. So like, I, I always think that if you've never failed or you've never got your ass beat, or there was never something where all of a sudden I got fucking hammered and thought to myself, that didn't work. Now I have to go back and figure out a new way to attack this. That's where growth happens. And like, I, I like, I'm always fearful of the athletes that never fail. Like the people that are the best at everything when they're younger, because they never seem to ever get anywhere. It's always the guy like the Michael Jordan story where it's like, I got cut off my high school basketball team where I was a walk on where they had adversity. And, uh, you know, long story short, I think the problem became that, all of a sudden by people started looking at this definition of fitness as increased work capacity. Whereas, you know, we've defined fitness, you know, a million different ways, you know, I mean, your fitness could be 1 million different ways. Yeah. I mean, it's let's uh, list every single one. Well, number one, got time uh, for that. how many children kidding. you have, right? So I'm, no, more, I, know, I, know. I have three kids. I'm more fit than you guys. Cause you guys <laughs> this is no, no. Uh, uh, not that we know like of. on an evolutionary point, but I think the idea that if I can do more work in shorter amounts of time, I'm fit. Whereas, if you look at the Olympics, I can't think of a single sport that's predicated off of doing more work. I mean, uh, you know, they never asked, uh, you know, well, Usain Bolt in, in the finals, you ran X, but what did you run in training? Cause that's how we're going to give you the medal. I, I do have care. a question for Derek about the same concept. So, uh, Derek, this is one of the pre-show questions I sent out about your you Canadian, son of a bitch. your Canadian hockey team. All right, let's boys. just go ahead and skip this question. I didn't read uh, those questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, anyway. I knew I liked him. I knew I liked him. <laughs> 
to prep our listeners. So in Charlie Prince's key, key concepts, right, he talks about Canadian hockey team and how they measured their VO2 max, and uh, it was through the roof. So record chart, and then they went and played the Russian hockey team. So this is during the Cold War in which they were cut off from all training records, so you don't know what the Russians were doing. And then Russian plays Canada team, third period. It appears that, you know, they weren't in good enough shape to compete. They were outskated, right? So then Canada spends the next four years just increasing their VO2 max. And what happens four years later when they play again? Russia still just uh, beats their ass. Do you know why? Well, I, I know why. It's because the, the threat of going to the no, gulag no, 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 no. and also going to <laughs> extremely motivating. No, but then they, they kind of uh, – Cold War breaks down. Finally, Russia hands over to the hockey team in Canada what they were doing, and it was simply more intensity work. Right, they yeah. were practicing faster and then doing more intensity but, speed work versus just but, quote unquote conditioning VO two max. But we know this from just even like a traditional gym but setting. What I'm like saying if, is CrossFit. If, they if don't you were this. to go and observe, and I've done this thing because uh, we we were based in Newport Beach, and we and about four or five months ago we moved here to Austin, Texas, and so uh, we shut our facility down. We're in the process of building a new facility, so I've been training at the Gold's Gym, uh, which is. Uh, fucking religious experience of seeing what people are doing you want to like go around and like hug these people like goodwill hunting like it's not your fault <laughs> uh, but it's uh it's interesting to see when you leave people up to their own devices and training they will inherently not find the method that will drive adaptation but they're, they're not for. left of their own devices these are sports scientists increasing the vo2 max but then in an intensity based uh i guess speed approach they appeared to be in better shape, third period shape for hockey, fourth quarter shape for football, but they just did more speed work. So the, the sport is predicated on max efforts. I mean, anybody that's ever watched right. hockey. So if you practice in that mode, like it, it's, it's kind of a weird deal that like, hey, if I do all this kind of a lactic type training over in here, it doesn't necessarily drive it over here to the short efforts. It's like, you, but we found that everybody knows we, that. No, they don't. That's why I'm. Well, we. we <laughs> I say the we sitting at this table and him sitting over there. Everybody this. in the world is right here. Ted. There's <laughs> one on the monitor and three over. Here. Okay. But no. this this is a, a counterculture in terms of conditioning. Derek, have you seen people or the sport coaches in your experience want to pull more and try to increase that fourth quarter shape or just do more work than your uh, your dosing with your athletes? And how do you present your argument to go against that <laughs> uh, well a lot of the time you just have to watch the sport and i don't think people watch it enough like they think that a high uh, like i think there was a promotion up here in canada where they're like oh we, it's nike 45 like 45 seconds we have to train for 45 seconds like you go watch a hockey game you know, this guy's skating around over here and gliding and this guy's, you know, around the puck, it's a little more active, but it's, you know, they down regulate because they know they got to play 82 games plus playoffs. And so nobody's doing anything that resembles, you know, uh, running a marathon or, uh, running a 400 meter sprint. It's, it's very intermittent and it's based on, you know, if, if you, or in soccer or hockey or football, if you're overrunning, you're putting yourself out of position, especially at the higher levels. So, um, you know, a friend of mine works for the top player in the MLS and he walks most of the game. And then when the ball comes, the sports scientists are saying, Oh, you're not running enough. Right. And it's like, he's the MVP. So, um, I, I you know, it's, I think, you know, if you let the sports scientists drive, how you should train people, all of their background is based on these parameters like VO2 max and wind gate tests and all that. And why don't you just watch the sport first and foremost and see who's succeeding? Um, and then like Charlie had this great example of when he went down to Australia of the, the MVP for rugby was this guy who was very explosive and he, you know, he'd just do amazing things on the field, but he'd always fail the conditioning test, which is like a 12 minute run or, or something or, and so they're they're punishing the guy because he keeps failing this test yet he is the mvp for the league and nobody's looking at him and going why don't we base our training around what makes him the best in the league they're just forcing their you know philosophies or their backgrounds on the league rather than you know reverse engineering it right so that that's the problem is that um 
people are not watching the game, I think, you know, they, and, and not talking to the athletes who are the best athletes. And most of the best athletes are going to be guys that aren't work capacity mules, right? So I don't know. It's we uh um i was fortunate to work with a team for the aussie rules football down in australia uh to help them with their programming and i remember their strength coach hits me up and he sends me all this data i mean it was like each player is running anywhere between five to 15 kilometers a game this is what they run in practice and he sends me the training program and it's all like you know three to five sets uh eight to 15 reps and it was all like this kind of you know bodybuilder s stuff and then they go run they do all these long runs and training nothing less than 800 meters their injury rates like 40 percent and so he's like, you know, we're trying to get the injury rate down. We're trying to figure it out. So I sent him back a program that was like single, double, and triple, no more than 15 reps on a single, you know, basic movement. Every movement was followed by some form of dynamic jumping, you know, whether it be broad jump, box jump, unilateral, single leg, uh, you know, for no more than one to three reps. And I kind of sent this program over and just a little assistance work. And, uh, and then in the training, uh, they would just do nothing but speed work. And it was everything. I think like max was like 80 yards. Um, it was like, you know, 10, 20 and it kind of cycled through. And he sends me back. He's like, I'm going to get fired if I present this. <laughs> I'm like, just give it a shot. So he goes in and made a case. And the, the, the coach was like, you know, our injury rate's so high. Let's see if we can change it. And my comment was like, why do you have to do this volume in the weight room and the training if you're doing this volume on the field? And all of a sudden, within a year, their injury rate was down to like 8%. And they ended up winning everything. And like next thing you know, they want him to go present this stuff. And he goes and present, presents it and gets torched by like, you know, all the other, you know, this is, you know, unbelievable. It was a fluke. There was no way this would ever work. And he calls me up and he's like, dude, these guys hated it. I'm like, well, of course, you know, because it's going against what they know. And I'm like, and these guys are so far behind the curve. They don't understand it. Uh, you know, they just think that, you know, whatever, like, you know, we have to try to mimic whatever's done on the field. And I'm like, we don't have to do that. They're doing that on the field. Why do I have to take that in the weight room and try to force these guys to do what they're doing on the field, especially for a guy that's running five to 15 kilometers a game. And even in practice, I'm like, yeah. this is miles. I'm like, uh, like overuse injuries. I'm like, and, like, and every one of their, their injuries was like hamstring, shin splints, hip, uh, you know, shoulder. It was all this overuse over movement. And I'm like, dude, let's drop the volume up the intensity and let them get the volume where, when they get paid. And instantly it changed and, uh, you know, it didn't seem kind of, I mean, it's, it, but it was amazing to see the resistance that he ran into. And I'm like, this is, seems crazy to me, but that's what we ran into. Yeah. And, and it's very simple. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't know what percentage of strength coaches fall into that trap and think they got to work the hell out of them and, and, and do more of the medium work. But, um, I think what has to happen, though, is that as strength coaches, they have to start expanding their horizons and, and educating themselves on, on this type of stuff. And it may not be within, and I say this a lot, it may not be within the realm of strength and conditioning. You may have to go look at studies on chronic fatigue. Or, and, and I talked to Pat Davidson about this, right? And he says, guess what? Most of the people in sports are not the smartest people in society. You know, boom, right? Um, so why don't we look at areas of, of research where they're actually pushing the envelope in terms of, you know, understanding the, the, the human body, the brain, the central nervous system, and then bring it back into what we're doing. And, and, you know, you know, I, I'm hoping that there's strength coaches listening to this podcast and, and obviously, you know, trying to improve themselves, but how many books on weightlifting, how many podcasts on, on, you know, running gassers or, you know, conditioning, do you have to listen to before you go, okay, I get that. You know, how many exercises do you have to come up with like single leg, double leg, you know, you know, quadruped exercises, you know, at some point you have to start going, okay, I got 10 exercises. Let's go with it. And, but let's look at the programming side. Let's look at how practice is done. And I think that's what I'm trying to push people towards is you're, you're after a while, you just, you're a hoarder of shit and you know, get out of your house, you know, start cleaning out all that shit that you don't need and figure out what you need. What are the essentials? And I think that's the message we have to keep saying is that you guys are, are not looking under the right rocks. Um, or at some point, you know, stop looking under rocks and start climbing up to the top of the tree and, and looking and seeing the landscape. Right. So. Well, I mean, uh, the idea should be that sport performance, so your ability to execute, whether it be on the track, the field, the pitch, the ice, uh, should be, you know, somebody should be observing that and then figuring out 
where, you know, you can effectively, uh, you know, shore yourself up or fix things. I mean, you know, I'm sure you've had great guys who are phenomenal athletes that you're like, I just have to prevent you from getting injured. So yeah. why don't we just do some injury prevention stuff? Why don't we work on a little bit of stability and whatnot? And then um, at the end of the day, like, let me just not fuck you up and get out of the way. I mean, we run into this when we go teach our seminars. Uh, you know, we teach people how to do basic movements. Like, hey, I'm going to teach you bilateral hip hinge and a squat. Uh, this is how I want you to set up. And on occasion, somebody will come in there and their setup is different than what we ask. But it just so happens that they have a really nice squat. And they'll be like, well, you know, he's not doing everything you said. And I'm like, at some point as a coach, I have what I want you to do. And then you watch people that are naturally good at what you're asking them to do. And sometimes you just take a step back and you don't fuck it up. And uh, I run into that all the time. I see people do things. It might not be 100% the way I want, but they do it so well that you're like, all right, they're uh, a singular case. Now we'll apply this over to somebody else and I don't have to overcoach them. And I'm sure you watch that with your sprinters. I mean, there's people that are just naturally excellent runners. And a lot of times you're like, all I have to do is just give them the, uh, the plan and the opportunity. This is how we get you. And I just need to stand back and not fuck you up. And, um, you know, and as a coach for me, especially, that's why I tell people, I'm like, don't let me mess you up. And uh, cause I watched so many good athletes, uh, talented football players that got fucked up by coaches who were trying to force them to do something that was either outside their wheelhouse or not within the confines of what they could do. I mean, I remember uh, as a young guy, uh, they wanted me to play tackle. I'd always play guard. And I remember my coach showing me these, uh, video or, or showing me film of all these different players. And I'm like, do you have any six foot five white guys? Because these are all six foot seven, six foot eight, 365 pound black dudes. He's like, what do you mean? I want you to do like that. I'm like, dude, that guy's got a seven foot four wingspan. I'm six, five white dude, 300 pounds. Like find me that guy. And he was like, Oh, that makes sense. And then he brought me in some like Jim Lachey and some of these, uh, guys who were about my size, Gary Zimmerman. And I was like, all right, I can do what those guys do. And I'll do that exact. And I ended up playing and he's like, Oh, you're doing great. I'm like, this, this, this shouldn't be this difficult. But, um, and for a lot of guys, I watched uh, coaches try to uh, force people to do things that were not within their skill set. And then those guys, oh, this guy can't play and get them out. I'm like, you as a coach have to find a way to motivate and work within each player. And if the guy doesn't have the skill set, get him out of here. But don't kick him out because you don't have the flexibility to understand what he can and can't do. And uh, that's what really has gotten me frustrated, especially with uh, a lot of this stuff is just finding what people can and can't do and then working within their strengths, never abandoning those for, you know, I, I, like I always kind of hated the, uh, you know, what people say is, oh, you should do nothing but work on your weaknesses. I'm like, sure, you should, you know, work on your weaknesses, but never at the expense of your strengths and who you are. Because I mean, for me as a, as an NFL player, I was, uh, you know, I was quicker, uh, you know, big punch and I'd start the fight fast. So I, mean, I wanted to get on a guy and, uh, you know, get him before he got going. Now, if I was going to set back and be a catcher's man, I wasn't going to win because I wasn't 350 pounds and I couldn't take a 350 pound dude running into me. You fucking kill me. Yeah. So I, I started the fight sw- uh, quick. And I remember them being like, Hey, we want you to do that. And I'm like, I'm going to lose. I know who I am. I'm going to fucking beat this dude on the line. And I'm not going to let him go. And then after a while they were like, okay, you just do what you, because you know, and I'm like, fuck, cause this is about winning and losing. And, uh, I'm not going to let you lull me into this false sense of security to think that as somebody I'm not. And um, I think for the sprinters, especially, I mean, you have great guys that are explosive out of the blocks. Other guys are great finishers. And you know, you, what do you do? You're like, Hey, let's improve you in the start. But at the end of the day, I need you to be you, which is you can finish and you can close. Could, Derek, could you say that's the difference between, or a difference between a track and a sport coach? Sport coaches often try to fit athletes into systems, but then a track coach is focused on optimization. Uh, well, a good track coach, because there's a lot of shitty track coaches too. So, um, I, I, you know, you, you can't paint everybody with the same brush, but a good coach by definition is, is going to do what John's talking about is, uh, again, we go back to, you know, I'm going to use EMS in a way that facilitates uh, the characteristics, the muscle characteristics, the fiber type uh, that the athlete uh, presents to me. And I think it's, that's the universal approach is what do you, what do I have? Uh, what qualities do you have? What do I have to make better? What can I build on that you already have? Like, um, you know, I sent a questionnaire out to, there's a MMA athlete who's got his first shot at a UFC bout. And he says, I want you to work with me. Well, I need information from you before I can come up with any plan. What, what were you good at? What did you feel you were good at? What did you enjoy doing? And, and, and then build it around that. But I think everybody wants to impose their template. Um, and, and as John said, I think we should start a certification called the, you know, natural selection facilitators group or whatever, 
And then that, that's your certification. You don't fuck people up. You just, you know, make them good at what they're already good at and, and preserve their careers. And if, if that's, that's all we do, that's a pretty important service. Um, but by, by t- saying we're going to make freaks and we're going to, you know, do all this amazing stuff, like, you know, get out of town, man. It's all recruiting. It's all talent identification and then nurturing it. Right. So, but, but that's, I mean, that is what I would consider late life cycle thinking uh, for accomplished athletes. You know, a lot of the guys that we work with are working with young athletes who are early life cycle, early adoption, untrained. And that's what, I mean, John, where does, I guess, Derek, where does EMS fit in with those guys? Like, um, because they're very malleable. Well, I mean, well, you, you, you have a higher degree of well, influence. Well, he, that, that here's organism. the thing. Like, I, I don't think uh, um, using EMS, uh, you know, I don't know what the FDA says in terms of like uh, um, ethical age at which it's to a, use it. It's just not on your genitals. That's all I saw. <laughs> uh, well, which it does. It's so not that on bad. On your genitals? I tried it. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, and, and I've, I've got this question posed uh, quite often. I'm sure uh, Derek can fucking school me on it. But um, for me, I always look at it and said, you know, uh, I don't want to alter movement patterns in the beginning. So if I can bring an athlete in and teach them basic, you know, uh, primal movement patterns, squat, step, lunge, whatever it is, uh, I want to teach those movements and I don't necessarily want to add other stimulus until they start showing me a little proficiency. Like for example, uh, I had a guy hit me up like, ah, oh, you know, I want to get my son into lifting weights. Should I have him do the EMS, uh, before he lifts weights? And I'm like, why don't we just slow the fuck down? Why don't you just teach him basic compound movements? I want him to, you know, vertical press, bench, squat, deadlift, like pull a bar off the ground and just teach him a little bit of jumping and just let him kind of understand his physical, you know, uh, I guess body awareness. Yeah, coordinate. Yeah, coordinate himself, you know, inter and intramuscular coordination and whatnot before we start doing things like short surfing and set your nervous system to get motor units to fire. So I don't know what that question is. Um, it very well might be that if you were to add EMS to an untrained athlete that was learning these things, you might learn them faster. But uh, I'm also a big believer that, you know, at some point you plant something and you let nature, let it grow a little bit. And if it starts to struggle, then you add things. I'm not the big one that's like, hey, let's put something in the ground and stuff it with a bunch of fertilizer just to see if we can help it from day one. I'm like, let's put something in. Let's make sure it's planted right. Let's add water, sunlight, whatnot. And as it starts to grow, then you kind of nurture it a little bit. And I think uh, we have this idea. It's kind of like, and I'm sure we run into this too. What supplements can my should or should my kid be taking? And I'm like, what does the food look like? Why don't we start talking about diet and sleep and recovery and the, all these other things before you start asking me what micronutrients you want to dose with the kid when we don't even know what the macronutrients are. So that's my stance. Derek, hey, man, thanks for your time. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want more, you know where to go, strengthpowerspeed.com. Derek, anywhere else that you want to point uh, any of our listeners? Uh, that's pretty good. I'm trying to work on a more of a service-based site that's, you know, training programs, mentorship. It's, it's sprintcoach.com. I've been sitting on that domain for like 10 years. You son of so. a bitch. What a <laughs> fucking URL. But... Um, yeah, I, I I just trying to make myself accessible and uh, see what comes about. I'm not. I have no grand plan here. I just any, figure. Any more speaking engagements? Um, I think I'm going down to New York, and some of the guys from IFAS, Bill Robertson and Mike, or uh, Mike Robertson and Bill Hartman, are doing just a little retreat in the Hamptons. So I'm going to do some coaching there, and everybody's going to collaborate. So that's kind of cool. That's in late July, but but nothing really lined up. A couple of book projects. Um, so there's a human kinetics plyometrics book that I helped put together. And so we'll see, it's nothing, it's not rocket science, but you know, you got to do a bit of the fundamental stuff and, and, uh, you know, I I like engaging in these discussions and just pushing the conversation into directions that it doesn't really, uh, get talked about a lot. So you guys are doing a good job. Well, thank you. Appreciate Appreciate it, Derek. So, Thanks again, people. Check them out. And Derek, have fun at the birthday party. <laughs> if, you're ever in, if you're ever in Texas in the Austin area, please look us up. Yeah, definitely. I hear Austin's awesome, so I'll, I'll get down there and uh, uh, we can do a live um, conversation or something like Dude, that. I'd, so, uh, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, we uh, we do this thing called um, Talk to Me Johnny Live, which is my, my blog's Talk to Me Johnny, and we 
tend to do a round table, like a live discussion. And it's been really good. We've done, um, you know, a, a bunch of them with, uh, you know, my buddy who's a, you know, former SEAL team guy and just different people. So, I mean, it'd be great to connect on that. And also, uh, we have our education module that we're doing and we're actually, you know, uh, reaching out to people like yourself and other high level thinkers to record some stuff for us. It's just kind of little bits of education pieces. And I, I think what you're doing in terms of not only EMS, but the idea to, you know, that kind of max effort and sprint and like, it's just, it, people need to be exposed to it. And, yeah, um, and, 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 and as much, and, and as much as I beat angles. this war drum, uh, it, it's amazing how many times I've referenced Charlie and people have never read his work. They don't really know. All they know was that he was, you know, Ben Johnson's speed coach who tested positive for drugs. Yeah. And, uh, I'm like, first of all, everybody takes drugs. So let's not be, <laughs> fucking honest. and, uh, you know, and I'm like, it, it just, it, I'm just amazed that people are so uneducated on this and it's, um, it's something that, you know, we, uh, we beat the war drum on and I try to love stuff down people's throats and hopefully they listen at some point. It's the best. It's all you can do, right? It's all you can do. Just oh, get the message out. And we're doing our best. So thank you. Awesome thank guys. You very much. Enjoy right, the thank birthday. You. See you Derek. Right. Yep. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Now it's time for you to empower your performance. Find Derek Hansen on his website, www.strengthpowerspeed.com and sprintcoach.com. His Instagram handle is at Derek M. Hansen. And if you're looking for that sweet Charlie Francis quote that John cocked up earlier in the show, here is Tex with the save. So quote from Key Concepts, Charlie Francis, the reason sprinters do bench press, a completely unrelated and potentially hazardous exercise is because high quality performances are the result of high quality training. What this means is with benching, you have a way to quickly develop a large portion of the body and additional CNS stimulation, which, which causes greater super compensation. The general effect is a stronger bench and a bigger upper torso. The specific effect is your body is used to that much more CNS stimulation. So when you taper and drop volume, that much more CNS reserves are available. Until next time, bye!